All right, you guys, welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. I do want to start off with a special thank you to all of our awesome subscribers who continue coming back and watching our videos and really supporting our channel. In today's lesson, we're going to continue our series of lessons on ICU drips as we begin to talk about our analgesics. But before we begin, if this is your first time to our channel and watching one of our videos, we do invite you to subscribe to our channel below. Make sure you guys hit that bell icon though and select all notifications, that way you won't miss out when a new lesson's released. I truly value the subscriptions, the likes, the comments that you guys leave. It really goes a long way to help support this channel, and for that I do want to say thank you. And for those of you who don't know me, my name is Eddie Watson, and this is ICU Advantage. Alright, so let's go ahead and jump into our lesson here and begin our talk about analgesics. And really, let's start things off and ask the question, what are analgesics? And so essentially, analgesics are a group of medications that provide analgesia. This is also what we know as relief from pain. And so really within this class of medications, there are many different drugs, and they really work in many different ways, either on the peripheral or the central nervous system. And it's important to distinguish that analgesics differ from anesthetics, which anesthetics are temporarily blocking all sensation, while analgesics are just working to block that pain sensation. And all of this is very important because controlling our patient's pain is one of the top priorities in critical care. And so because of this, in almost all circumstances, we want to be addressing pain before moving on to other medications for sedation. So definitely medications that are going to have a very important role in the care that we are able to provide to our patients in the ICU. All right, so now that we have that out of the way, the next thing I want to talk about real quick is something that we call the pain pathway. And this is going to be a little bit of pathophysiology to really have you understand how we go from some sort of injury and stimulation to our perception of pain. To do that, I've got a couple key parts that, that play a role in our pain pathway here. And so within this pain pathway, we actually have two different pathways. The first one is what we call our ascending pathway, and the other one is what we call our descending pathway. So we're going to start off talking about our ascending pathway, and this is the one that's going to be responsible for transmitting that signal up to the brain. And so to really start things off, let's imagine that we have some sort of injury here. And so what happens when we have this injury or pain is that this is going to lead to cells releasing something that we call prostaglandins. And these prostaglandins are going to be the first step in transmitting that signal of injury or pain. Now this is where our NSAIDs and aspirin are actually going to work by helping to decrease the prostaglandin production. And so what happens now is we actually have these sensory nerve fibers. It's what we call our nociceptors. And these nociceptors are going to respond to these prostaglandins. And they're going to take the signal and send it back to our spinal cord, specifically in this area that we call the dorsal horn, which is essentially this area over here. These nociceptors are also going to be known as our first order neurons. So now here in the dorsal horn, that first order neuron is actually going to synapse with something that we call our second order neuron, and the second order neuron is going to cross over and enter our spinothalamic tract. Now, in order to transmit this signal, though, from the first order neuron to the second order neuron, there's actually a chemical that we call substance P. And it's a substance P that will allow this signal to transmit from our first order neuron onto our second order neuron, which, like I said, crosses over, enters that spinothalamic tract, and this will travel up through our brainstem and terminate in the thalamus. This is also what we refer to as our relay center. Now here in the thalamus, the second order neuron is going to synapse with a third order neuron. And so now this neuron is going to carry the signal up into the appropriate area of this somatosensory cortex. And that's essentially this area of our cortex. And so the somatosensory cortex is going to play a very important role in two different things. 
One is it's going to discern what area our pain is in. And two, this is where our perception of pain is going to happen. So very important part of this pain pathway because now we're able to identify where the pain is coming from and actually have that perception of pain, which is a very valuable thing to have. And so that's essentially our ascending pathway, going from that point of injury and pain and ultimately transmitting that signal up to the somatosensory cortex. Now let's talk a little bit about our descending pathway. And this is the pathway that's going to be responsible for controlling and inhibiting the ascending pathway. So here things are actually going to begin in our midbrain. And here we're going to have a neuron that's going to go down and synapse in our medulla. And this neuron here is actually going to go down and synapse into the same dorsal horn of the spinal cord. Now this neuron is a special one with the name serotonergic or noradrenergic neuron, and it's going to play a very important role down in this dorsal horn. And so let's actually expand things out here just to give you a better idea of what is going on. So here we have our first order neuron that's coming in, and here is our second order neuron. Again, we have substance P, which is carrying that signal. And then now we have this serotonergic or noradrenergic neuron. And so again, the goal of this neuron is going to be to inhibit or control that communication that's happening between the first order neuron and the second order neuron. And so what's going to happen here is this neuron is actually going to release serotonin and noradrenaline. And that's actually going to bind to our first order neuron and is going to inhibit the release of substance P. In doing so, we're going to be inhibiting that transmission of the pain signal. Now we do have something else interesting that goes on here, and that's with another neuron that we actually call an interneuron. And this serotonergic noradrenergic neuron is going to also stimulate this interneuron. And so what happens when it's stimulated is it's actually going to release an endogenous opioid, something that we call encaphalin. And this endogenous opioid is going to serve two purposes. One is it's going to inhibit the presynaptic neuron from, again, releasing substance P. But it's also going to inhibit our postsynaptic neuron, and it's going to help to prevent depolarization, ultimately stopping that continuation of that signal further up to the brain. And as you can figure out, this is actually where our opioids are going to work, as they're going to work just like these endogenous opioids. So here you can see we've got a couple different things going on with inhibition of that first order neuron being able to release that substance P. Again, this is going to be what's primarily responsible for transmitting that signal to the second order neuron. But through the activation of this interneuron, we're also going to be inhibiting that second order neuron from being able to depolarize. And you can think of this as essentially raising the pain threshold. If it becomes harder to depolarize, it takes more of a signal, more of a stimulus, so essentially more pain in order to finally depolarize and send that signal up to the brain. Now, in addition to that, we also have these receptors here that are called our NMDA and our AMPA receptors. And again, these receptors are going to play a role in that depolarization. Again, if we're activating these receptors, it's going to require more stimulation in order to eventually trigger that action potential of that second order neuron. And it's actually these NMDA receptors where ketamine is actually going to have its effect. And so there is actually more that's going on here, but really for the sake of simplicity to really kind of understand this pain pathway and sort of what's going on here, I think this really helps to illustrate that. And so initially we have that injury that takes place, and that triggers those prostaglandins to be released. These prostaglandins are going to interact with our nociceptors, or that first order neuron, which is going to propagate that signal back into the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, where it's going to synapse with that second order neuron through the use of substance P. And again, that release of substance P 
is going to be inhibited both by our serotonergic noradrenergic neuron, releasing the serotonin and noradrenaline, as well as through the opioids being either administered via medication or being released by the interneuron, also stimulated by the serotonergic noradrenergic neuron. From there, the second order neuron, depending on its inhibition by the opioids, as well as the inhibition of those NMDA receptors by ketamine. And so if enough of that stimulation, enough of that signal is coming through to overcome the threshold, and we trigger that action potential of the second order neuron, it's going to carry it up through the brainstem into the thalamus, where it's going to synapse with that third order neuron, ultimately carrying that signal to that somatosensory cortex, very vital part of our brain specifically designed to tell us where the pain is coming from and to give us that perception of pain. This is a very interesting complex set of interactions that are all working together to ultimately provide us with the sensation of pain. And so hopefully now after this lesson, you'll have a little bit better understanding of what this pathway is that's involved, how these medications are going to potentially impact this pathway, and how we get that analgesic or that pain relief effect from the medications. We're going to carry that knowledge with us into the next lesson where we're actually going to talk about these different medications. And so with that said, I do want to thank you guys so much for watching. I really hope that you found this lesson informative and useful for you. If you did, please go down below, hit that like button, leave us a comment, let us know what you thought, or feel free to ask us any questions that you might have. Like I said, make sure and keep an eye out for the next lesson in which we take a look at what the actual medications that we're going to be using in drip form as a form of analgesia. But before that lesson comes out, feel free to head on over and check out the last series of lessons that we did in which we took a good look at the endocrine system. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. You guys have a great day.